All right. Um, so without very much further ado, I'm going to, since we're starting a little late, uh, I'm going to introduce Nick and Chris. Nick and Chris. Nick and Chris. Sorry, you changed positions. All right. Uh, so please give a warm Shmukon 2020 welcome to Nick and Chris. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Nicholas Miles, and um, I manage the zero day research team at Tenable. And my colleague here is Chris Lyon, uh, a senior researcher on Tenable zero day research team. So we're going to talk about the ESP32. Uh, here is an ESP32 development kit. Uh, the chip we are interested in is highlighted in the green box. And as you can see, the SOC is quite small. There's a flash chip built in, which can be up to 16 megabytes. And uh, this is the board that we actually use for testing. So um, what is an ESP32? Well, it's a popular platform used in smart IoT devices like cars, cameras, uh, light bulbs, appliances, and wearables. Uh, quoting Express IF, who manufactures the chip, the ESP32 can perform as a complete standalone system or as a slave device to a host microcontroller reducing communication stack overhead on the main application processor. And uh, we'll see an example of how it's used in a slave configuration coming up. So this is uh, how it's designed. There's two Extensa LX6 CPUs, and they're labeled here App CPU for application and Pro CPU for protocol. Um, originally, the ESP32 had an asymmetric design where one uh, core was dedicated for protocols and one core was dedicated for applications, but they've since moved away from that and switched to a symmetric multiprocessor design where both processors can be used interchangeably and they use the same addresses to access memory uh, with a few exceptions. Um, I think the uh, Pro CPU can, is only one that can access uh, the RTC fast memory. And there are 13 peripherals that, can, that are equipped with DMA, like UART, SPI and Wi-Fi, and as mentioned before, it's got up to 16 megabytes of programmable flash memory. So um, this is where we ran into this at and where all this research, what spurred all this research, uh, Simply Safe SS3, that are version 3 alarm system. And this is the base station. So it's the brains, it communicates with the cloud via Wi-Fi, and also it can has a cell, cellular radio as a backup. And, um, all the sensors communicate via RF on uh, 433 megahertz. So while researching this, we became interested in the RF module and because it was being used by a PIC microcontroller in a slave configuration. So the ESP32 was being used in slave with the PIC. So you can see um, where the RF module is. On one side of the module, there is a, a chip, a Texas Instruments chip, for handling the, the 433 megahertz communications with the sensors. And uh, on the other side was the ESP32. So it's employed for giving the base station a connection to the cloud, sending status updates, allowing the homeowner to arm and res uh, disarm remotely, modify the pins, and it also is what allows the uh, alarm to be updated over the air. So um, the problem we ran into is when we dumped the contents of the Simply Safe Flash, and we did this by desoldering the flash chip on the um, Simply Safe and moving it, and putting it in our dev kit, and placed the flash on our dev kit with using a heat gun. Um, we found that the data that we dumped out using the, the framework, the dev framework, there's a tool to dump the, the flash. We found out that there wasn't a whole lot there that was initially easily, you know, nothing, nothing really apparent. Um, file just calls it, file just marks it as binary data. So we just ran it through um, Benlock to see what we could get. And also not very helpful, there was a bunch of Unix paths, paths some um, certificates, some private keys, um, maybe some SHA-256 constants. So we needed to figure out how the, the flash was organized so we could do a a static analysis. And ultimately our goal was to figure out a way to convert the um, ESP32 flash dump into a format that we could load into IDA or Ghidra or whatever tool that we decide to use 
preferably without having to install any loaders or plugins. And um, it would be nice to have a repeatable process, so we needed to, to uh, write a tool for it. So before we started, we looked into other research that was done. Um, we did find a blog post that was really well documented about how they reversed NESP8266, which is the predecessor, but we couldn't directly use that information because it was an older chip. Um, we also found an IDA Python plugin for handling the extended CP, which we did use. That's that's pretty awesome. But it doesn't, you know, we still need to load the binary into IDA to start with. And uh, we found uh, an ESP bin to ELF, but it was for um, DSP A266 again. And we found out about this a little bit too late that there was a, a tool by uh, uh, Jay Rosner for um, loading the images into IDA. Um, but ours is a little bit, our approach is a little bit more tool agnostic, as you'll see. So the next section will be, des will be, uh, will be discussing the ESP32 firmware image layout, and it will serve as an intro to the section that follows. And this, we're basically just gonna talk about the online documentation, um, but we will teach the audience the functional, the foundational knowledge you'll need to understand the, the firmware build process. And we'll talk about partition types, image sections, and over there updates. And is it you? Okay. Uh, our ultimate goal was to take an arbitrary flash dump from the ESP32 and extract an ELF um, so we can analyze it with IDA Pro. So IDA and Ghidra on most tools can, you know, handle ELFs no problem. So you don't need to use any sort of loader. But um, in order to extract the ELF, we have to make sense of the composition of the flash contents. And we need to understand the build process used to populate the flash. Um, so the ESP32 utilizes um, two bootloaders. Um, the first stage is stored in ROM, and the second stage is stored in flash. And the first stage really doesn't do anything more than um, reinitialize the state of the chip on reset, and then load the second stage bootloader into RAM before handing off execution. Um, from this point forward, if I say, if I make mention of a bootloader, it's stage two. And the bootloader is stored in flash at address hex 1000. And um, it's, you know, for our purposes, it's mainly responsible for booting the application image. And that bootloader is built by the dev kit and uh, sent down to the chip when it's programmed. So, um, First, the bootloader reads the partition table from hex 8000, which is the default location. The partition table is also built by the dev kit and sent down during programming. Um, and ultimately, a partition containing an app will be chosen to boot up. And that's based on the um, data in the OTA data partition. Um, so that, that, the app is whatever the, you know, contains the code that whatever the developer decided they wanted the chip to do. And, um, and let's see here. Actually, here's a UART log of the boot process from our Simply Safe device. Um, you see there the first stage bootloader initializing the hardware. Uh, you can see here where the second stage bootloader is actually being loaded at the first stage into memory. Um, you can see here where the it's parsing, it's loading the partition tables. Uh, looking at the OTA data partition and then actually picking an app to boot. And then you can see that it picks um, OTA1 to boot. And that's, you can see the offset there and it corresponds with OTA1. So there are a bunch of different partition types. NVS is for non-volatile, it's a non-volatile storage system that stores key value pairs. And we'll talk about that at the end. Um, Phi init is like a, it's not really used anymore. It, it's all this data is now put into the app, but it's, it contains hardware configuration parameters, and you can actually prune that out if you want to save space. Um, a lot of devices have a factory partition, but um, if you can, a lot of people to save space use OTA zero as the factory. So that's the like whenever the manufacturer builds, the, you know, the device, they they will flash it with the, you know, the, the a default uh, app, and then. The OTA1 is actually is what 
is what is updated over the air with the new firmware. And that's in case, you know, if there's an issue flashing OTA1, then it can roll back to the factory. Um, so there's also, yep. So now that we know how the flash is laid out and what the partitions are, we'll be examining how the data is structured in the application partitions. Um, these are the OTA partitions and the factory partition if it exists. And I'll hand it off to Chris. All right, so now we can start talking about the, the application image format. So if we were to look back, we'll be looking at the factory and OTA0, OTA1. Those are all apps. So from a high level, this is how an, an app is, is uh, composed. So you've got that app image header uh, followed by, um, so for every segment, you'll have a segment header followed by the segment data. Um, and then you'll have a checksum byte and optionally for more integrity verification, you can have the SHA-256 checksum and a digital signature. So now we'll look at the app image header a little bit closer. And that header, there's a lot of fields, but mainly the main takeaway here is that it's split up into what they call their, their common header and then the extended header. Um, so in the common header, you've got magic word, you've got segment count, flash read mode. Um, you'll have the, the flash read speed, which is frequency, the chip size, and you know, if the ESP32 can have a variable chip size, like Nick said, it can be up to 16 megabytes. Um, and then also in that common header, you have the entry address. And moving down to the extended header, uh, you've got the write protect pin, um, spy pin drive settings, chip ID, um, and then the, the minimum chip revision supported by that application image. Um, and you got the reserve field, and if you wanted that SHA-256 checksum, um, there's a Boolean value for, for that. The segment header is a little bit more simple. You've just got the load address and then the length of the data. And so there are two different segment types. You can have um, applications or data. And so right here we're looking at, at the app type. Um, application code can be loaded from a couple different um, memory regions. So you've got instruction RAM. Uh, mainly you'll put something into RAM if you want you know, uh, high speed. Uh, but by default, if you don't place your code directly into RAM, then it'll end up in flash, and that's the IROM. Um, so if you place it into flash, it ends up having to get mapped into memory w by the, the MMU. And then the, the final segment type there is RTC fast, or real-time clock. So that's basically for, like, if you, you, you put your device to sleep in low power mode. Um, so that's where the code would be placed for that. And so on the data side, again, you can put your data in RAM, ROM, or RTC. Um, but generally, in, in DRAM, you're storing non-constant data and then zero initialized data. In the, in the flash DROM segment, um, that's where constant data would be stored by default. And then also, as we'll see in the next slide, there's a specific purpose for that DROM segment, and that's for describing the application image. Um, and then on, for RTC, there's the slow memory, and that's for global and static variables, which run from RTC memory. So as I just mentioned, the DROM segment has a specific purpose for you know, describing the application. And it's got all these fields. Um, again, it has its own magic word. Um, and then for anti-rollback purposes, there's a secure version field. And then you can see there are two reserved fields. Um, it also has the application version, um, project name, compile date and time, and then the development framework version, and again, uh, that SHA-256. Okay, so now we, we've taken a look at uh, the application image format, so you can kind of see how it, it fits into the grand scheme of things. Um, so you've got that stage two bootloader at the top that Nick talked about, followed by a partition table, and then um, there are some, some other data and configuration related segments. Um, then you've got these app, apps at the bottom. Okay, so before we can actually start pulling, um, you know, extracting what we want out, uh, we need to kind of understand the build process. 
So we'll take a look at that. So in this section, in order to kind of help show the process, we're going to go from like an app source code and then all the way through, you know, taking you through the build tools and showing you the outputs. So, you know, as is customary, we'll start with a Hello World application. But basically what this does is it prints out Hello World. Uh, there's some chip information that gets printed out. And then the chip will reboot after 10 seconds. So in order to, to build the application, it's pretty simple. You're using the development framework. Um, so you run idfpy.build, or idfpy.build. Um, and if you were to look into that build directory that's created after the build process, you would see the hello world elf file. Um, and if you're not familiar with what an elf is, that's, that's the um, executable linkable format. And like, if you're going to run an, app, an executable on Linux, that's, that's the format you're going to run into. And then you'll also find the hello world bin file. And that's the, the app image that we just talked about. Um, also, there's the bootloader directory and the partition table directory. So these are all outputs of that build. In the bootloader directory, you'll find a bootloader elf and then a bootloader bin. And in the partition table directory, there's also that, um, that binary format. Okay, so, so after you build, the IDF will tell you that, okay, now it's time to flash the, the code onto the device. Let's, let's put the, the application on there so it can run. And this is the command that they tell you to run. Um, if you take a look at the bolded text there, you can see that we're flashing the bootloader at hex 1000, um, partition table at hex 8000, and then there's that hello world binary flash at hex 10,000. Um, but you might be wondering how we even got the, the bin files to begin with. And the answer to that is um, there is a function in ESP tool, which is also uh, provided by the maker of the chip. Um, th there's a, a process for converting an, an ELF to an image. So the first output is the ELF file, and then that ELF gets converted to the binary format. And the partition table, th there's no ELF actually produced for that. Um, instead, you, you define a partition table with a, a CSV file, and then that gets converted, again, with a, another tool they provide. That gets converted into the, the binary format. And at the bottom here, you can see the partition table that we use. And this, this comes with the IDF. It's just one of their default layouts. But you've got um, NVS, um, OTA data, Bionet. Those are all for storing data and configuration. And then you've got um, three apps, factory and then the OTA apps. Um, so if we look back at that command to flash everything, um, it kind of makes sense, right? You know, Nick, you know, I told you that the bootloader gets placed at hex 1,000, uh, partition 8,000, and then the factory app is at 10,000. And when we actually upload the code, this is the, the output we get, which matches up with what we just saw. Um, you know, want a write to hex 1,000, 8,000, and 10,000. And here's the output that we expected. Uh, we get hello world, we get the chip information, and then we also get a reboot after 10 seconds. Okay, so we, we went through from application source code and we built that and then flashed it, right? So now we kind of understand the build process. Uh, first, the, the bootloader and the, the application our, you know, the developer's application get turned into an ELF, and then they get converted into that binary format. But the partition table goes from CSV to that binary format. Then it's all flashed onto the firmware. Okay, so now that we've kind of got an overview of that build process, um, we could take a deeper look at how the ELF gets turned into the, the binary format. So, so this function here is an ESP tool, and it's the, the elf to image method. Um, you know, I've, I've got a lot of code to show you, but don't, don't worry if you can't follow every line. Um, I've tried to do, I've done my best here to kind of highlight the important parts. So just, just follow along here. But the first step when we're converting an elf to the image is um, to load it up in, in that elf file class. And that's a, a custom class. Um, but basically, you know, it loads the, the name of the file, and then it calls a uh, read elf file. So next we'll look at read elf file. 
Um, and readl file has a, just as the purpose, all, of, all it does is validate the elf. So it's checking to make sure that elf um, header structure is correct. And then also since the ESP32 has an extensa architecture, it checks to make sure that that CPU is extensa. Um, the section header entries are also checked to make sure they're of proper size. And then we have to have section headers, right? Oh, and then at the bottom there, if, if all that passes, then we, we read the sections. So this is a little bit less complicated than it looks. Um, let me show you a little closer here. So when we're picking sections to, con to add to the, the application image, um, all it does is it looks for um, ELF sections of type program bits. And then also it makes sure that that section has an address not, not equal to zero, and the size of the section has to be greater than zero. So it actually has to contain something. And so sections of type program bits are on the left here. You can see we've got you know the text section. That's where your code's located. Uh, Read-only data. You know, the, but the the big piece that gets left out, and that would aid us in our analysis process, is the symbol table. So, you know, at the end of the day, once we convert everything, we won't have function names. Like, you won't see those in Ida Pro. So that's, that, that's problematic. Okay, so just to recap real quick, when we're loading that ELF file, uh, we perform some validation, make sure the ELF is, is of the proper structure. It has a, it's built for extensa. Uh, section headers look good. And then um, there's some criteria for selecting the, the ELF sections to convert, and that, you know, type program bits, um, address can't be zero, and then that size has to be greater than zero. Okay, so now that we have an idea of how the ELF is loaded, we can see how that, that firmware image is built. And that's the ESP32 firmware image class. And I hope you can see here, but there, there is no value passed to that constructor there. So here's the constructor, and since we didn't pass a load file to it, only that top section gets executed, so the if block beneath it doesn't. So zooming in a little bit here. Um, all it does is initial, initialize some class members, and you, you might recognize some of them, like uh, flash mode or flash size frequency. Those were from the, the app image header. Okay, so if we move down a little bit, now that we've initialized that, that firmware image, um, so the way they build out the, the image is first they, they copy over that ELF entry point, and then you can see, so let me zoom in a little bit. Do you see where image segments is populated with E dot sections? So the way that works is those ELF sections, that, um, that class is actually a subclass of the firmware image segment class. So it, you can just do a direct copy, and it copies over the the ELF section address, um, data, and then the file offset. Okay, so here's a graphic to kind of help wrap that up. Um, you know, so we're copying an ELF over, we're converting that ELF into the app image. So we'll copy over the entry point, and then we can copy over ELF sections and image segments directly because that ELF section is a, a subclass. And the final big piece here, now that we've kind of built everything out, is, is actually saving that firmware image to disk. And there's a lot of code for this, fu this function, so I've tried to split it up into several slides. But here's the beginning. So at the, be at the top, you see we're writing out the common header and the extended header that we talked about. Um, and then, you know, we've got that checksum. Um, and then an important part at the end here is that the flash and RAM segments are split out based on their, their address. Um, next, we have a sanity check to make sure that flash segments aren't going to be written in the same 64 kilobyte flash mapping region. So you can't have two flash segments in that 64 kilobyte space. Um, and according to the, the comment there, I don't know if you can read it, but actually you can't. Um, if that were to happen, that would be the sign of a broken linker script. And so after that, after you, you check to make sure the flash segments will be written in the right spot, we have to write out those flash segments. Um, and like I said, this is 
they're aligned on 64 kilobyte boundaries, so it's a little bit tricky. Um, if, if it were to be written with improper alignment, the section would end up getting padded, and you can pad a flash segment with either a non-flash, like a RAM segment, or with um, no bytes if you don't have any segments to use. So after we've done the flash segments, we'll write out any RAM segments that are remaining. And after those RAM segments, if secure padding were opted for, we would, um, we would pad the segment with, um, with no bytes. And so after signing, after signing the image, that it would end on a 64 kilobyte boundary. And finally, we append that checksum. So since we potentially added padding and whatnot, um, we have to update the, the segment count. And then the SHA-256 digest is, uh, is recalculated. And then finally, at the bottom there, you'll see that the byte stream is actually written. Okay, so we got another recap. So this is image.save. Uh, first, we, we, you know, we write out the common and extended headers. Um, memory segments are written out, and there may be some padding. Uh, and finally, we, we update the segment count, you know, depending on how, how padding was, was added. Uh, and then we also would, would update the checksums and whatnot. Okay, so now we've taken a look at how an ELF is turned into an image, and that's part of that, that build process. So now we can start getting into our tooling, and I will hand it over to Nick. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the partition table parsing. So the first part of our tool handles the process of, of reading the partition table. Um, there could be a maximum of 95 entries, and there's no way to know in advance how many will be present. So um, we just loop through until we hit um, the in the the, seg the final partition table entry, or hit the hit, but hit a bad magic, or the, the final entry, which has a different magic, which actually has an MD5 sum that you can use to validate uh, that the partition table is is, is valid. So um, basically, the format is there's a there's a magic beginning, two magic bytes. There's a partition type and a subtype. Um, there's an offset address and a partition size. And there's a null terminated uh, six string for the label, and there's a at the end there's some flags. And right now it's just used to tell if the partition is encrypted or not. Um, they don't use it for anything other than that. And you can see for the partition types, there's either app or data. If the partition type is app, then there's a subtype of factory or tests. And if the partition type is data, then there's a subtype subtypes of OTA, RF, Wi-Fi. Are NVS, so it's pretty simple to parse this. Just iterate through until you hit the uh, the uh, final or the you know end of the partition table, the final entry, and then just load everything up. All right, so I want to take a step back here. Um, so Nick talked about partition table parsing. So that's how we'll actually locate an app image. Um, so this is some read elf output, and this is of that hello world elf that, that you know I produced at the beginning. I uh, just want you to take notice that the highlighted sections here, um, you know, their type is program bits, address is not zero, and size is greater than zero. Um, so at the top here, the same graphic we just looked at, but I chopped it. Um, the bottom image shows that elf to image process, except I added some output to kind of help help you visualize what's going on here. But so take notice of um, the first, so when, when the first flash segment is written, um, it has three padded segments following it. So that's what we just talked about. Then you got another flash segment, and then at the end, there's that final RAM segment being written out. Um, another thing to take notice of is that IRAM zero is split out into vectors and text. Um, so then, and then also that IRAM text segment is split out as well. And that happened because of the whole padding process. Um, so again, at the top here, we have that, that um, elf to image process with the output. At the bottom, I'm showing you the result. So when we produce that hello world bin, that the bottom piece is showing you uh, a tool that's provided with, the, or a function that's provided with the ESP tool 
and it shows you all of the segments that were written out. So this is kind of just here to, to show you how ELF sections are, are named as segments. So like if you look at the flash read-only data in yellow, um, that's written out as DROM. And then, so if you go further down into IRAM, um, again, it's split into vectors and text. And then that text section is split out into another IRAM segment. So that's why you have three IRAM segments. Okay, and, and here's the, the mapping just to help you visualize what's going on. So again, take notice that there are three IRAM segments. Okay, so now we'll, we'll actually start talking about the toolkit. Um, there are a few functions that we've added. Number one is, so if you, if you dump a flash off an ESP, you can show all the partitions that are in that, that flash. We can also dump a specified partition. Um, and then we can also convert a specified app partition. We can only convert apps. And then finally, we're able to dump the, the MBS partition and show whatever data that the application developer might have stored. Okay, so, so this is where our tool comes in. Instead of ELF to image, we've got an image to ELF function. Um, and fortunately, we were able to reuse some of the code provided by the, the chip maker. Um, so you see at the top there, we, we call load firmware image. And thank you to the developer because we, we didn't have to write any code to do that. It parses the image and, and loads all, you know, everything we need. Um, and then so we're, at, we're building an ELF file and we used a, the make ELF Python module. So we linked that at the bottom there. But you know, we set the, the ELF to be little endian, extend the CPU, and then um, we copy over that entry point. So think of it as the reverse process of what we did before. OK. So in order to, to convert back, um, we, we're using that same mapping that we looked at before. So you can see at the bottom here, we created a map. Um, like, for example, the flash read-only data maps up to DROM. Um, flash text maps up to IROM. Um, but you will notice that we haven't included the IRAM segments, and that's because of the way that they're split up. Um, it's kind of a special case. So you'll see how we'll handle that. And the other thing is we haven't accounted for uh, the real-time clock yet. That's, that's on the to-do list. Um, so the next part was to set up the section header um, attribute map. And at the top here, you can see the read elf output. And in the, the box, those are the, the attributes there. So you've got you know, like the, your flags, um, whether it's writable uh, or executable. Um, so we basically just built out a map um, for building those, those sections. So using that, that map, we can, we can now c actually construct data for the segments. Um, and as I mentioned before, the IRAM vectors and text are separated into multiple IRAM segments. So that's why we've got that if block here. We can't just run through the map. Um, and then padding might be added. So we account for that as well. Um, so now that we have that section data reconstructed, uh, we, can act, we can append those sections. And when we do that, we have to set all of those attributes that we mapped out. So you can see, you know, when you build this section, um, number one is the program bits. We have to set that type of the section. And then we're also handling the flags and, and the, the attributes in that map. OK, so and then next, we'll add a string table back in and a symbol table. And the idea behind this is to help like pretty up the results when you load the elf into IDA um, so that you, know, you can get xrefs to your strings and whatnot. The only problem is that um, you won't get function names that you're looking for because we're only adding absolute symbols. You know, we couldn't do dynamically linked stuff. Um, and so next, we had to build out the program header table. And again, we used a map for this. Um, so you could see, like, we have the flags on the right-hand side. Um, and we're setting, we're setting that in the map, like read, write, read, execute, similar concept to the uh, as I described earlier. Um, and now we loop through that segments dictionary, um, add the new program headers in, 
And again, we have to account for the, that IRAM special case. And finally, we write that ELF back out to disk. So again, it's, it's a reverse of the process that we looked at before. Okay, so now we've seen how our tooling can extract an ELF from a flash dump. Um, but before we move into loading into IDA Pro, I'm gonna hand it over to Nick to talk about NBS. So um, most, you'll see an NBS partition on these devices, and it's uh, basically a key value data pair store. It can be encrypted, and our toolkit can dump it as well. So it's organized into pages, each with uh, 4,096 bytes and each of these pages contain 126 entries, which actually contain the key value data pairs. Um, the ESP32 API contains functions for interacting with the storage. Uh, basically, you need a namespace and then a key, and then you can access the data. Uh, it's small, doesn't have any sort of indexing data structure, so pulling the data from it requires a linear search. Um, they don't recommend that you use like a real file system if you need anything more elaborate than this. Um, so, this is what it looks like. Um, this is the page. So, um, like I said, it's 4,096 bytes. And below the, the little diagram is uh, a dump from our tool of the first page. Um, each entry, uh, you can see that there's an entry state bitmap, and um, each entry has two bits in the bitmap, which takes up 252 bits to the 256, so there's the four last four ignored. And what's interesting about this is that um, um, the erased bitmaps still contain data. Uh, so from a forensics perspective, there's lots of interesting data you can pull from it, including like previous uh, BLE pairing configurations, things like that. Um, each NVS storage entry contains 24 byte header and eight bytes of data. So for the integer data types, the data field actually contains the data. There's like uh, eight, 16, 32 bit signed and unsigned integers. Uh, for blob and string, uh, the data field contains size information and a CRC32. And the data is contained in the subsequent spanning entries. There's no um, header on those, just the raw data. Uh, for blob index, there's uh, metadata in the, in the data field to uh, a large to enable large blobs spanning multiple pages to be reconstructed. Um, if the NS value in, this, in the entry is zero, that means that the entry is a namespace definition, and uh, the key is the namespace name, and the value uh, is actually the namespace index. And you can see an example of that, like the first entry there, it's defining a MISC um, namespace with the index of one, and the second entry actually uses that namespace. So here's a dump from our tool of, of um, from the NVS, and you can see here that this actually contains cr credentials on the Simply Safe. The Simply Safe doesn't encrypt the uh, NVS partitions. So you can pull all the Wi-Fi stuff out. It's pretty cool. Um, so if someone, if your burglar steals your Simply Safe, you probably should reset your Wi-Fi password, assuming that the you know router actually didn't get stolen as well. Um, and here's an example of an erased entry, and it actually contains a previous Bluetooth config. So I thought that was pretty neat. And then we're going to demo. All right, we, we got a short demo. It's, it's not live, but I'll show you some, some screenshots of our tool in action. Okay, so here's the first part where if you, you hook up your ESP32 and you want to dump the flash. Um, so they, you know, they provide a tool for you to dump the flash, right? So you're reading flash um, four megabytes. And so here's that show partitions function that I was telling you about. So you can see that there's an NVS partition, like Nick just talked about, that stores all the data, like Bluetooth config and whatnot, um, OTA data, and you've got the apps that we're interested in, and then there's a spy FFS. So basically, this gives you an idea of which which partition you want to convert. And so here's our, our new function in, in action, the create elf. There's, there's not much output, but it produces app0.elf, 
And so when we want to load it up in IDA, um, we choose a processor type of, of the, excuse me, processor type of Extenza. And we ended up using a specific IDA um, processor module for this. So thanks to the, the Mad Inventor for helping out with that. And once we loaded it up, it, it worked like magic. Um, we, got the, we got the control flow diagram they were looking for. And we got our strings and cross-references to strings. So we were, we were able to reverse the logic in there and, and do some deeper analysis. And if anyone's interested in checking out our GitHub project or contributing or reporting bugs, whatever you might find, um, check it out. We've got a link here. Um, and also, Tenable's always hiring researchers. So I dropped a link here at the bottom. And I'll hand it over to the audience for questions. Yes. You want to take this? Yeah. Um, that's actually something I'm looking into doing. because uh, I've had the same idea. No. But that would be really good to have. Um, because, you know, as you said, the symbol table is basically stripped out. So it's really difficult to analyze. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, good, work, good question. Good Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. So the question was, can you, do you know how to dump, um, is there a tool that can dump the, the flash without removing it and soldering and whatnot? I'm not aware of a tool, um, but if you find one out, let me know. I mean, we didn't really look into that hardcore. There's probably a way you could solder something onto it, the board, to get it. But yeah, it's, we took the easiest approach, which that, that chip is pretty easy to desolder, so. Thanks for coming.